Hello, everyone, and thank you for choosing to watch our presentation. So during the 10-week research period, we're tasked with creating a program to simulate the fall of an object on Earth. The focus of our research this summer has been to develop and analyze an experimental design and perform trajectory simulation for sample return mission. We've been working under the lab of Dr. Asma to UH Manoa. He studies small satellites and autonomous guidance, navigation, and control for aerospace systems. This includes entry, descent, and landing, as well as his work with drones, such as quadcopter. And our mentor this summer has been Melissa Onishi. My name is Lindsay Augustine, and I'll be majoring in aerospace engineering this upcoming spring semester at UH Manoa. My name is Noah Thompson. I am a freshman at UH Manoa, and my intended major is aerospace engineering. My name is Karen Nichols. I'll be transferring to UH Manoa in spring 2021 to finish my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. So here's our agenda. We'll be going more over about the project before moving into our data collection and analysis. Entry, descent, and landing is such an invaluable part of interplanetary exploration, and Carol will now be explaining that. So entry, descent, and landing, or EDL, is the part of the mission where a spacecraft enters the atmosphere at a very high velocity and must land safely with zero velocity in a short amount of time. In the case of the Mars Curiosity rover, the spacecraft entered the atmosphere at about 13,000 miles per hour and landed in seven minutes. The main idea of EDL for which all problems follow is slowing down and slowing down safely. The graphic here shows many phases involved in the EDL process. Each phase serves to slow the spacecraft down, which is a violent experience for the lander as well as for the equipment being transported inside. And due to the large distances these spacecrafts travel, it must also be prepared to land autonomously or without direct control from people. A program is created for the spacecraft to land on its own by taking measurements of its altitude and velocity and stunning the area beneath it to avoid crashing into the local topography. It must also land within 100 meters of a specific location. To deviate from the location could result in months or even years of lost time as the rover needs to travel to the location it was supposed to land at in the first place. A key point to note here is that this is the same landing process that has been used for the last 50 to 60 years, which means that the EDL process is dying for an update. Current EDL research is focused on updating this process to maximize efficiency. Our goal as engineers this summer is mainly to get an introduction to the EDL process and to understand what it takes to contribute to a mission so vast and multifaceted as EDL. The EDL mission itself is highly dependent on simulations and modeling because organizations simply lack the budget to send something off and hope that it lands safely. In order to maximize a limited budget and not waste millions or billions of dollars, researchers choose to create programs that can predict what the landing will look like with very high accuracy, thereby ensuring that when they send a spacecraft off, it will land safely. And this is the focus of what we intended to study this summer. Our goal was to study a return mission to Earth by creating a program that simulates the position and velocity of a falling object as it descends to Earth's surface. And there were three main objectives to our research this summer. The first and most important part of our project is to understand EDL. There are many parts that make up the EDL mission, such as design, simulation, experiments, and testing, but it all begins with an understanding of the fundamentals. So throughout the project, we studied recent EDL missions, astrodynamics, orbital mechanics, differential equations, and coding. Our second objective is to conduct drop tests to support our knowledge of EDL and the relationship to simulations. The drop test is a simple experiment intended to act as a bridge between our understanding of the EDL mission and our simulations by allowing us to see the connection between real and theoretical data. Our third main objective was to learn to code in MATLAB. As we mentioned before, models and simulations are our best friend when working on the EDL mission. Our goal this summer is to become familiar with coding in MATLAB and our objective with coding is to be able to simulate the fall of an object, which requires a rather sophisticated knowledge about math and its translation into code, as we've learned in these past few weeks. But before conducting the experiment, it was important to understand the difference between kinematics and dynamics on Earth. All right, so what's the difference? The apple tree on the left represents kinematics, which is the study of motion where gravity is constant. It involves solving for a solution at a specific instance in time. The picture of the satellite on the right repre represents dynamics in which gravitational acceleration is constantly changing with time. Dynamics deals with the rate of change and solving for differential equations produces multiple solutions. Now on the next slide, we see this through equations. For kinematics, you can plug in numbers and solve. They're clearly very simple and straightforward. 
Dynamics, specifically the equations of motion, utilizes differential equations which are complicated enough that, com that computers are usually used to solve them. For our research, it is important that we understood and applied both techniques. Our experiment utilized kinematics and our program applied the equations of motion. Next, Carol will go over some of our trials and show us how it looks like. This graph represents trial one of our drop tests. We use these graphs to collect data about the initial and final heights along with their velocities. The blue and yellow points represent our data in the y-axis where the blue points are experimental data and the yellow points represent theoretically calculated data. The only force in the object is coming from gravity which only acts in the y direction and for simplicity purposes we only intended to study the fall of the object according to gravity and we did not intend to look at the x position. Because of this, we did not measure the range of the object, and that's why we don't have a theoretical trajectory of the exposition. However, this graph is a good example of what we expect to see in terms of the y position. It curves, which indicates that the velocity is changing. And all of the position graphs look more or less like this one. They vary, however, in the specific heights and velocities. As you can see on the graph, the experimental results of our drop tests are in approximate agreement with what we would expect to see. And moving on to the next slide, we provide another example. This is, a, this is a position graph from trial number three. The trajectory deviates slightly more from the theoretical points, and we paid careful attention to these deviations. We gathered that the errors possibly came from the tool we used to collect the data, a lack of precision in the experimental procedure, and forces on the object that were missing from our calculations. Accounting for the sources of systematic and random errors will be useful in helping us understand what factors we must include into our simulation. For example, we decided not to include drag into our equations, but if we did, the theoretical calculation may agree more with our experimental data, and that would be supporting evidence that our, that our simulated program must also account for drag. In the future, we can redo our experiment to study more of these factors to conclude what the sources of our error was, and to give us a comprehensive idea of what factors must be accounted for when considering the EDL mission. Now on the next slide, we analyze our data from the drop tests. Here we averaged out our results into four sets of data, which are the two heights for each object, so that we could find an average velocity for each set of data to compare with our theoretical results. We also had a few other data points for these tests, but we've taken out the ones that don't have an effect on our outcome. The chart above in includes the average velocity for each set along with this comparison to our theoretical results that we got using the percent error formula. Our percent error ranges from 4.9% to 10.3%. The percent error is pretty low, but there's always room to find out why it isn't lower. Throughout the project, we analyzed the data and conditions that may have affected it, ultimately collecting data for a more realistic program. We will do the experiment very differently in the future. First off, we'd account for the range of the object to study position in the x direction as well as the y direction. Next, we'd use a different tool to measure height and velocity, perhaps an accelerometer, but not every tool is accurate. We would also conduct trials from a higher initial height, use different shapes, and lastly, account for more complex factors and incorporate drag into our calculations. Next, we'll cover some of the MATLAB done throughout the project. For MATLAB simulations, the team was challenged to program a code that could display freefall from an altitude of 125,000 meters all the way to zero. This proved to be much more difficult as we had to perform more complex calculations by using a dynamical system of equations within the code as shown earlier. During our programming, we found that cal when calculating values in EDL, numbers must be precise. Whether a single value is positive or negative determines the outcome of the entire simulation. And due to the time restriction, after successfully simulating the altitude and velocity of the falling object, the simulation does not consider the lander's orientation upon entry, so we can't determine exactly where it will land. Uh, although we didn't meet that part of our initial goal, we were able to gain more knowledge about the simulation of falling objects and the series of calculations involved. So on the left, you'll see a plot of altitude versus time. You can see the altitude is going down as time progresses, as one would see, expect to see from a falling object. And on the right, you can see the velocity increasing as time progresses, and this is expected due to gravity's pull on the object. This introduction of coding in MATLAB is a first step that will help us to work further towards more complex and involved programs moving forward. And speaking of moving forward, for our overall project, if given the opportunity, the team has some ideas of what we might like to do. 
This includes including the position within the horizontal axes within our code. We'd also like to add complexity, such as accounting for more factors like drag, shape, and orientation within our program's calculations. In addition to this, we'd like to extend the program to model falls and other celestial bodies. <clears throat> and finally, we'd like to decrease our experimental, experimental error, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, as understanding the sources of error will help us to make a more accurate code. And going further into accuracy, because the EDL project is so heavily based on modeling, it's important that the models are accurate in order for them to be useful. The way we plan to improve upon that is just to simply improve upon our knowledge throughout our course of study. And personally, we feel that we're young in our research and believe this project has more to offer us in terms of experience and knowledge. We'd also like to develop our coding skills because in addition to simulations and modeling being important in EDL, programming knowledge can be applied throughout our careers as well. Finally, we'd like to be representatives for minorities in STEM. That way we may encourage more individuals to in underrepresented groups to aim further than their circumstances. And after completing the work done throughout this 10 week research period, we took some time to reflect on the experience. And we feel that we're bridging a gap within this program where we work with others in similar situations with struggles that are very similar to our own. Through every experience from this program, we all grew as a team and as individuals. We utilized our technical strengths and together produced well-rounded work. We we're also able to develop skills that helped us to work as a team and at different points during our research period, helped us to lead each other in the right direction. Finally, we also learned to adapt as a team by overcoming unexpected obstacles like figuring out coding and syntax. On the right, you'll see a graph that was created to display the amount of growth we've made. It's a simple exponential growth graph as we've grown a lot, but it's only a sprout as this is just the beginning of our growth as students, engineers, and role models. Before we conclude our presentation, we'd like to give some acknowledgements. We'd like to acknowledge Dr. Asimov, our mentor, Melissa Onishi, and Ensem. Mahalo for attending our presentation. Please leave any questions or comments below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you.